Let's stand and sing number 375. Number 375. Good morning and greetings to all in Jesus' name. We welcome you all here this morning. I'm uh, not going to go through the announcements. Brother Darwin's going to do that at the end of the service, so I usually do forget things, but I do, I'm not going to this morning on that. Darwin's going to take care of that. So I would like to 
talk about a few things that's happened to me in the last couple of weeks. And <clears throat> I know for some of you or a lot of you that are thinkers that can think through things and process, process things quickly do not struggle with this. But for me, in my life, when I get a lot of things thrown at me and a lot of different things, it takes me a while to process these things. And sometimes I just need to take time and just think for a while and try to understand what is happening, what is being said, and just try to process this all in my mind. And so these things that three or four things I'm going to talk about here this morning, I was thinking that I should make a sermon out of each one of them, but then as I was thinking, I don't have it processed or thought through enough to do that. So maybe this will be a prelude to some sermons in the future, but a few things that I would like to go across. Um, it started about two weeks ago. My wife was begging me to get the tractor and help clean up the outside to prepare for winter. And I procrastinated to the very end of the day, and we had just enough time to do all this cleaning up. And I made a statement to her. I said, this is very sad for me. This is hard for me to do because I don't like to think about going into winter. And so last Sunday as I was at Yarsburg, Brother Allen had a devotional, and he talked about the winter months. And he made a statement. He said, I don't struggle with the winter blues. And I thought, aha, I got one thing figured out that I do struggle with that. I've been trying to tell myself for the last few decades that I don't, but actually I do. So I was trying to think about what I can do to combat this, and I was thinking about being thankful, being content, and so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking of all the things I'm thankful for. We think of the people in Ukraine and Russia this morning. We think of the people in Florida that went through the bad hurricane, and all the things that I, that I have, that I am blessed with, that I can be very thankful for. And so I was feeling pretty good about this. I was very optimistic, and I, I was very thankful. And as I looked at the weather and seen it's going to be warm for the next couple of weeks, I was very happy. But inside, there was this small voice or this subtle thought thinking that it's going to get really cold or it's going to be cold for a long time into spring. And it kind of took my thankfulness away and kind of took my joy away because I can't even enjoy this warm weather because I know what's ahead. And so as I struggled through that and tried to process that, I went to work Monday, Tuesday, along in there. Someone came up to me and asked me if I bought a lottery ticket. And I said, no, I haven't. And they took me by surprise. And so I explained to them about the lottery and that I don't play the lottery and everything. And they said, you must not understand. And I said, no, I must not understand. They said, it's at $1.6 I said, oh, wow, yeah. Well, I'm still not planning on buying one. And so... The next day, I had to work night work, and so I was working with a few guys, and they were talking about this lottery too. So I got out my phone and started Googling, and I thought, maybe I am missing out on something, and they were right. It is at $1.6 Well, maybe now is the time. And so as I was thinking through this, and as the night went on, it was about 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, and they went over to the lottery machine, and they started buying these lottery tickets, and they stood there for a very long time buying these lottery tickets, and I made a comment, so I noticed that they had an addiction greater than just playing this Powerball for one time, that they had an addiction with buying lottery tickets and gambling. It had a hold on their life, and all the stories they were saying about how they won this. And so as I was having a conversation, the one man looked at me and he said, I guarantee you, if I spend 40 more dollars, I will, I will win 10. And I, and I got to thinking, like, what, what for logic is this? This is still a 75% loss. I don't understand. And so anyhow, I tried to talk through that. And as I was thinking through that, I'd like to read from 1 Timothy 6, a couple of these verses I thought about that helped me think through the state of what these people are in, the bondage that they are living in. And I'm not going to go through all these verses. I have a few more things I'd like to cover. But 1 Timothy 6, 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. So that is very powerful. And we're not going to get into that this morning. But it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich, fall in temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men into destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after. And that was the word that really stuck in my mind. And the list of things that these men could come up with that they wanted if they would have won this money, it was more than I probably thought of in my entire life. I mean, there is a few things that I wouldn't mind having, but it just went on and on. But 
and says they have erred from the pace, faith and pierced themselves through, me, through with many sorrows. So that was the one event. <clears throat> the other event that happened was, was in a conversation with some people and they were talking about the diesel fuel shortage, which I knew nothing about. So as you can tell, I do not follow the news much. And so they were telling me everything that was happening. I just simply made a comment. I said, you know, it doesn't affect me that much. Most of my vehicles are gas. I said, it just, I, I, and they said, no, you don't, you don't follow through because every, how do you think you get all your supplies and all your parts? I'm like, yeah, that's true. And so as I was in this conversation, I said, well, there's not much I can do. I don't have any resources to fix this problem. So the only thing I can do is just continue to do what I'm doing and let whoever's in control of that figure that out. And they went on to say that I wasn't thinking about this properly and that I need to be more involved and care more about this. And as I got to thinking, there's many verses that talk about um, God being in control. And, there, and I had to go, and I, don't, I didn't go and look for the verses, but it talks about where God will take care of tomorrow. He takes care of the birds. He takes care of the flowers and everything like that. And we don't have to worry about tomorrow. I don't think God is asking us this morning to bury our heads in the sand and not be aware of what's around us and be on guard. We are called to be aware and to make wise decisions. But, it, but, it, but we are not to worry. We are not to uh, be involved with that. Um, and so as I was thinking about that, I have a lot of things that we have, we can be thankful for this morning. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual song, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have so much to be thankful for this morning. If you're discouraged or if you're worrying or if you have fear, look at what you have. Look at what God has done for us. We have a lot to be thankful for. And what really spoke to me this morning was the second song I think that Brother Kendrick uh, led this morning. And it sums up what has been going through my mind the last couple of weeks. And it just really struck home to me. And I'm sure you all didn't think about it as much as what I did when he led that song. And I'm just going to read a couple of phrases. It was uh, number 940. It says, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word." There's a peace there that comes with that just to take him at his word. We do not have to take this upon ourselves. Just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. So that's a comfort that we can have this morning of trusting in God with everything in our lives. With these thoughts, let's uh, bow our heads for prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for being in control. Thank you for being all-knowing and all-powerful. And just thank you that we can rest in you and rest in that fact and, and help us to cast all of our worries and fears, whatever they may be, to you. And just help us to be aware of the things that are around us and help us to make wise decisions as men and women for you. Lord, as we look to this coming week, as it is a week of elections for many states and many different offices. Lord, have your way in that. Put in office who you would see fit. Put down whoever you don't. And just help us to rest in the fact that you are in control, no matter who and what the outcome is. Just thank you for loving us, and just thank you for all the blessings that you have given to us. We are blessed beyond measure with the many things that we have Thank you that we can come and worship in a building and a facility like this and as a church group. Just thank you for each person that is represented here as a visitor, as a member. Just thank you for their contribution this morning. Lord, just be with Brother Terry as he stands before us and speaks. Just give him words to speak and just help us to take to heart what you would have him to share. Just be with us in the coming week and keep us in your will and in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning to each of you. I welcome you all here as well, uh, especially the visitors. I hope you feel at home here. I'd like to consider two words this morning. The words 
vocation and the word occupation. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. It's the only place in Scripture that we have the word vocation. We're going to read about vocation. We're going to talk about that, and then we're going to consider our occupation, and then probably toward the end of the message, try to bring those two things together. The title of my message is called The Vocation Occupation Situation. Ephesians chapter 4. I beseech, I'm sorry, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. The first three verses that we read are all one big long <laughs> run on sentence that's pretty typical of the Apostle Paul's writing. It says, you were called. Was this a personal calling to me, Terry Martin? Was this a, a call that was to a group of people? It says you were called. Who called? What called? When, when did this calling happen? And we have this instruction to walk, to walk worthy of it. Well, what's the walk? Where are we walking? And then it goes on to describe the, the heart and actions of the one that's walking. Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing. And then he invokes other people. He says, forbearing one another. And then he uses the word endeavoring. <laughs> endeavoring means to, to make an effort, to work toward a goal. Well, what's the goal? The goal here it seems to read that it's unity and peace. And why is that inserted here? What does unity and peace have to do with a calling? And then verse 4 comes back, speaks of this called and this calling again, just like in verse 1. It would all seem like it's pointing to something spiritual, something that would be important for us to consider as a Christian. Something that, with the emphasis that he puts on it, could, should be more kind of a top of mind awareness as a Christian. But this word vocation, simple definition of the word vocation, it's translated everywhere else in Scripture to mean calling. You can reread that, take the word vocation out, put the word calling in, and now you have called or calling used four times in four verses. So we want to look at some of that in this message. And I just thought to start out with maybe an explanation of calling. There's different definitions of calling, even in the biblical sense. Uh, there are terms that are closely associated with it, like called or a call. What, what it is not. It's not a special calling from God to do a spiritual work in the church. That, that God has super Christians that have been given this elevated level in his kingdom somehow, and they've been given some special spiritual power to perform some special spiritual task. And that's important to understand that, because if you read anything about world history, and you go back to the Middle Ages, there were these two main divisions in society. There were those who worked, and there were those who didn't work. And they didn't work because they were a ruling class. So there was the working class commoner, and there was the ruling class of people. Uh, you were born to work, or you were born to rule. There was a third class of people that society had, and they were neither working class or a ruling class. They were holy people. They were holy men. And they 
performed all things related to, to spiritual, spiritual things, all things religious, was handled by those people. And men that could devote time to, to spiritual contemplation and thought. Well, what came out of that idea? Well, the Roman Catholic Church. And, and they bought into that and they ran with it and they called it clergy. And from that came the Pope and the priests and all this hierarchy of man-made definition of church administration. And clergy not just had this special calling, they had special power. And it was supernatural, and they could transform bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation. And they could even absolve people of their sin. We know both of those things to be false. And with that social divisions came the expectation that a vocation, if you were called with a vocation, that you didn't have to work any more than what was absolutely necessary. And so they separated themselves from work almost to the point of calling it a sin. Work was for the commoner. Uh, it was for the peasants. Well, we don't believe that Scripture gives any place for that type of class division or an exemption from work. But we do call leaders today. We do ordain leadership within the church. And that is a special calling from the, from the church and we seek God's will and wisdom through that whole process. But the church leader, or minister, or deacon, or even bishop, which is called to administrate in the church in various capacities, is equipped by God to preach and to teach and to lead. He's not a, a level above the congregation in any kind of a spiritual way, or really in any kind of way. Uh, this platform could probably be lowered by 12 or 18 inches, would be fine with me. Uh, scripture uses words like shepherding, uses words like servant to describe the role of ministry. So the word calling is not speaking to that here in Ephesians chapter 4. Within the church, uh, some level or an exemption from work. It's interesting as you read Scripture, New Testament Scripture, the Apostle Paul went to quite some length to teach and that, that preaching is actually work and that it should be supported and compensated. Now, I'm not going to get into all that, and I thank you for your love gift, but that uh, was just kind of coincidental. Uh, he also exampled that he personally wasn't dependent upon that in Acts chapter 20. Verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So he worked and he earned his living and yet he still ministered. There was times in his life when he couldn't do that. There was times when he was a prisoner. And he was dependent on other people to support him in that way and to meet his needs. But when he was a free man, he earned his living. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about occupations. There really isn't any place in the New Testament that God called someone to a special role that exempted them from work. There is the example we have in the book of Acts where they ordained deacons. But that, that wasn't so the apostles could relax a little bit and go golfing. That was, be, that was more or less a division of responsibilities. They were being overwhelmed, and so they divided up the responsibilities within the church. It didn't create some privileged class. And the reformers, uh, they worked very hard to tear down that system. That had, been, that had been built, this special class of people apart from those who worked. Because they had seen firsthand what had happened. Um, it led to all kinds of corruption. This, those with this vocation handled spiritual matters, and they, those that were called to work or born to work didn't handle those things. And so they could use this as a type of power or authority over those people. 
They could abuse it. Uh, there was a concerted effort by the Catholic Church to keep Scripture out of the hands of what they called the plowman, the commoner. And so if they could keep Scripture away from the common people, they wouldn't have the ability to read it and to see that they could confess their sins to God and that they could be made right with God. They did not need a priest in between there to do that. They didn't need to confess sin to a priest. It was uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ a person could be made right with God. So the Reformation started with the priests that were honest people, read the Scripture and knew that it was being twisted and that it was being an abuse of power uh, from what it actually taught. And they stood up to this teaching, they stood up to this false doctrine, and they went against this thing called a vocation. So I'm pretty sure that's not what Ephesians 4 verse 1 and verse 4 are describing. There's another sense in which you hear a term, the term calling used. It's in relation to someone that's sensing God's leading or guiding them or blessing their plans to serve. Maybe in missions, place of voluntary service. You hear people say things like, God is calling me to this. And we sensed God's call to go here. My wife and I felt a call to get involved with this work. And there's a danger in that. There's a danger in using the word calling for that. One of the dangers is that it automatically kind of shuts down anyone that questions that desire that you have. Uh, can be misused as a permission to kind of follow your dreams or to follow whatever aspiration that you want. Sounds godly, sounds spiritual, but it could be actually rooted in more of a selfish ambition. We'd be better off to just acknowledge that we felt a desire, uh, a personal desire to do something like that and consider whether that's what it is. Do I, I have the desire? I have the skill set? I have the qualifications. I could do that. Uh, I don't think they're wrong desires. I don't think uh, that would be wrong for a person to, to go through that process of thinking if they would uh, consider a few other things before they move forward on those desires alone. We can desire to serve God in His kingdom in, in a way that we're not currently serving God. Uh, but we're going to need some better direction, some better affirmation, and continue to serve Him as faithful as we can right where we're at. Discerning God's leading and direction. That, that is an important thing to consider. It takes a real spiritual openness. It takes a real spiritual transparency. It takes a willingness to seek counsel from godly men and women. And that's not really my message this morning. But I give it to you as another sense of the word calling that I'm relatively certain isn't what Ephesians chapter 4 is speaking to. And by the way, I don't think that everyone who uses the word calling in that sense is, has those motives. It's a very common use of the word, but left, left unchecked or unacknowledged. I think it can br bring someone out to a kind of a misguided sense of God's leading. So it doesn't mean those two things. What does it mean? I told you it means calling. The term calling is used several places through the New Testament, uh, usually by the Apostle Paul, and, but it's specific to an individual calling of God upon your life as you serve and obey Jesus with, with full and complete freedom, without reservation, without any encumbrances, you're serving Jesus Christ. And with, within that sense of the word, there comes this thing that we say, a call to repentance, almost a, a sub-definition, if you will. Luke chapter 5, verse 32, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. 
Then we have the, the verse it talks about a call from darkness into light. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Which in times past were not a people, but now the people of God. Which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Every Christian is called to holy living. Well, what does a calling look like for you and me? It should look like a, a complete life of holiness under the Lord. A life of holiness has a hope, it has a promise, it has an expectation. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and ye are called in one hope of your calling. The same Jesus that they called Jews also called Gentiles and together called them to this very same life of holiness because the ones rejected it, it was opened up to the Gentiles. And so together they have the same opportunity and they have the same hope and they have the same promise of heaven. They have the same promise of, of eternal glory of heaven. Another place, the Apostle Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that is a calling that's not going to come about by accident. It's not going to come about by just careless walking. He uses it in the sense of a prize of running a race. It's going to take effort. It's going to take determination. This calling that's on your life and on my life, this calling to holiness that fully encapsulates our life doesn't, is not something that we can turn on and off and back on again. This is a completeness 24-7. And everything comes under that. Everything comes under that holy calling. Everything. And so to make that happen, for that to happen for you and me, is about surrender. And that's an ongoing work. That's an ongoing part of our walk is a surrendered life. My will being broken. My will being surrendered to Jesus Christ. I'm walking and I'm operating under new ownership, under new management. We sang that song maybe last Sunday. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take mine heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at your feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. That's encapsulating. That's a full, sold out, surrendered, committed life that we have committed ourselves to. That's the call of God upon your life and my life to serve Him. Surrendered and sold out. That's the definition of calling. That's the definition of vocation. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. Nine through eleven. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So this wasn't this wasn't something that we deserved, this wasn't something that we earned. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am a tent maker. The owner operator of Apostle Paul's tent company. Isn't what he says. He says, I am a preacher, a 
an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Would it have been wrong for him to say that? That is how he made his living. That is what he did. Um, Paul, servant of Jesus Christ, and a tent maker. I want to just hit Paul's on vocation, on calling, and talk about occupations and work for a few minutes. tried to make a list of things, occupations that our heads of home, young men are involved with in this congregation. And I did kind of a dangerous thing. It hit me one morning while I was still laying in bed. So I would close my eyes and try to go back through the benches thinking about who people were that sat on what benches and make a list of what their occupations were. And that's kind of dangerous at 48 years old to, to go about it that way. But uh, throughout the week, I was made some corrections. And, and I may have these wrong because of that. Or I may have a, some, some of you, I don't know what you would say. You do various things, various days. Uh, so I kind of use my best judgment to f- put down. We have uh, several truck drivers, one retired, a livestock broker, five farmers and one retired. We have a doctor. We have a health care. I don't know what uh, DeLynn and, and Brandon would, would say they, they do it at Faith Mission, but I called it health care. We had a welder. We have three school teachers, two electricians, three auto mechanics, two people involved with farm equipment, repair, a landscaper, a tool salesman, furniture sales, a man that retired from office furniture setup, a forklift salesman. We have three people involved with lawn care, a realtor, an excavator, building contractor, ag supply elevator, three people working there, clock repairman. A lot of diversity as you start to think about it. I don't know that I've ever put the thought into it, all the different occupations that you all have been involved with. Jesus also taught us about work and production and gaining. And Jesus taught with this parable of the nobleman and the stewards and the divisions of talents and goods. And he gave this instruction in that parable to occupy until I come. So that's really the only place that I can find occupation in Scripture, because occupy is the root word of occupation. Uh, But it was a command, and he used it in his parable. So that entire principle of stewardship is that these things that we have are not ours, but rather they've been entrusted into our care. And that's that's a pretty long list, too. We have bodies that are are healthy and that can work. Um, We have minds that are at least sharp enough to think and process things. And I'm like Brian. Sometimes it comes on so many things that I have to kind of time out. I'm going to have to think through this a little bit. Uh, But we've been given talents. We've been given abilities. And we've been given wealth. And we've been given money. And and with that, we reinvest those things into other projects and to produce more goods and more services. This is capitalism. And we're to use all these things knowing full well that they're God's, and He wants us to use them in a very specific way to enlarge His kingdom in just a multitude of ways. And that with all of that, we're going to give account someday that the nobleman is going to return. And when he does, he's going to ask for a meeting. And in that meeting, we're going to be asked to produce a report of what we've done with these things and how we've taken the increase of these things and used them in tangible ways to enlarge the kingdom, to occupy, to work, to toil, to increase, and with that increase, reinvest. And the amazing thing about this list 
And you probably haven't been listening to me. You're trying to match these up with people. Uh, the amazing thing about this list is, is I could make another list that long of things that our sisters are involved with. A list of everything that a wife, a mother does for the household. And it may or may not make money or save you money. But let me assure you, it's ordained by God. And it's blessed by God. Do that work as unto the Lord. It's absolutely part of God's redemptive plan. And you can think about that as you change a terrible, smelly pamper later on today. That, that is all part of God's redemptive plan for humanity. Just as much as it is your husband bringing home a paycheck. Never forget that. And we could have a, another, probably another whiteboard of side businesses and things that families do together for extra income. Anabaptists don't need more sermons on how to make money. We do pretty well at that. So probably more of a challenge is getting that money and those resources back into the kingdom of God. We tend to want to hang on to those, hang on to that while it passes through our hands. And we wind up spending plenty on ourselves and in trying to increase our own happiness. Well, occupations are a part of our identity. Men tend to identify much stronger with occupation than what ladies do. Men that meet as strangers will invariably start a conversation that very quickly leads to a comparison of occupations. What do you do? What do you do for work? Those types of questions. Ladies, when they meet, are more relationship-oriented. They tend to talk about their family, their children, those types of things. Occupations and work are a big part of our identity. Jesus had an occupation. He had a skill. He had a trait. Um, I think that was, they said, is not this Jesus the carpenter? And then they listed his brothers and sisters. They knew him as that. Many of the disciples were at least at first commercial fishermen. And we know that as you go through those, the, their interactions with Jesus Christ as his disciples, they went back to that. They, they didn't drop, they did initially drop their nets to follow him, but they, they supported themselves with work, with their occupations. Simon the tanner, Luke the physician. These men had occupations that identified them. And there's nowhere in Scripture that I can find that, that cast occupation and work in some kind of a negative light. But everything in Scripture would point to the fact that our work and our occupation and our resources have to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That everything here, not sin, not at all, but it needs to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It really doesn't matter that the modern use of the word vocation has come to mean occupation or life's work. That really, doesn't, that really doesn't matter in this conversation. Our occupation and the identity that we derive from it has to become under the calling, has to come under the vocation. If vocation is the calling of God upon our lives, if it's holiness unto the Lord, as I said, it's not going to be some, some wild revelation or some startling dream to go do some special task for God. Rather, it's a surrendered life. Rather, it's a walk that is worthy of His calling. Occupation is work. And it's the ability to produce income from the resources that God has given us to use. And the situation, as I call it, is that surrender. The things that make up my identity, I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And in that, I'm able to find and experience God's blessing on my life as He recreates me with a new identity. And that doesn't mean that we stop doing these things and pick up another line of work. It may, but probably not. It very likely 
our current occupation can be blessed by God if we surrender it to him. This, this new identity is much less about our occupation and the standing and status that we derive from it and much more about a channel from which he's able to move resources into the kingdom. Our occupation is work, and work is just one of the things that need to come under his calling upon our life. It isn't sin. It isn't outside of our vocation. It isn't sin unless it's outside of our vocation. Even the plowing of the wicked is sin. But there's many other calls that God brings upon our life, more than just occupation. Um, you can think about you can think about this. You can think about have I been called to marriage? Okay, that's a call. To bring marriage underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ, the potential of that. What could that mean? Hopefully you're experiencing that. But if you had a couple that was married, not Christians, and they were living together in peace and harmony, you say, well, what's the difference? There's a big difference. They're going to, as they come together under the lordship of Jesus Christ, they're going to realize that now are they not just living for themselves and making sure that they're both happy, that their marriage can bless a community. Their marriage can bless neighbors. Their, their marriage can bless a family. So that's another thing. Children. God, God calls some of us uh, to children. Well, you can certainly, there's, there's plenty of children in the world that aren't experiencing uh, Christian homes. What do we have, the potential that we have as our children to bring them underneath a vocation. It's a powerful opportunity. There's a lot of responsibility with it, but there's a lot of opportunity with it. So you have things like talents. You have things like abilities. Oh, he has a really strong tenor. Well, great. Can that come under the lordship of, of Jesus Christ? Um, someone has an artistic touch. That's a great thing too. Can it be used to bless someone? Maybe your only ability is that you can grill pork chops without burning them. Well, can you use that in some way to bless other people besides yourself? There's responsibilities inside the church. And it's not all preaching and teaching. There's someone that made sure that the heat was turned on or the lights were on or the air conditioning or whatever. And last Sunday, the, the ushers were busy. So there's a lots of responsibilities inside the church that are also part of a calling. Our occupation is work. It's the means to an end. Strong, strong call of, the, of a steward. With that part of my identity as a steward comes resources that I've been entrusted with. And you could make whiteboards full of these things. All the things that you've been gifted, all the things that God has blessed you with, whether it's a piece of property or a, a house or, or other goods and wealth that he's given to you to use. And these things all fall under the calling or the vocation. And yes, it is, it is work. But again, it is not sin. You go back to Genesis. That's where we find, find work first. It happened in the garden before the fall. Adam was to dress and keep the garden. That was work. Okay. Whenever man fell, work did not get cursed. The ground got cursed. Work just got a little bit harder. So work was always there. It was ordained by God. We are to be a part of that. It is not somehow less of our experience or somehow or another kind of the negative side of our life that ugh, we have to work. It's a blessing that's God ordained that he's called almost everyone to with the exception of someone disabled. 
So work being a blessing. So now you have abilities, and you have the ability to play the piano, or you have the ability to play some other instrument. Well, that's great. Can it be surrendered? Can it be used by God to bless other people and to enlarge His kingdom? Or are you going to use it to mainly bring attention to yourself? So you just got a new car. Well, that's a great thing. Can it be surrendered? Can you surrender it and use it in His kingdom? How will you do that? If you don't, if you don't think about these things, if you didn't buy the car with that thought, then it just becomes another way to make people turn their heads. And you've lost the entire blessing. You've lost what God wanted you to do with that blessing. So maybe you have a savings account that's building up. That's a great thing. Can you surrender it and say, God, what do you want me to do with this growing savings account? At what level of your savings account are you somehow allowed to spend it as you see fit? You know, at what point is it just God say, that's fine. You got enough saved up. If you want to, if you want to take a two week trip, just with that savings, what is that about? Why have you blessed me with the abilities, with the talents and with the opportunities to, to increase? What do you, how do you want me to use it? How much of it should I save? How much of it should I use in direct work to enlarge and expand your kingdom? Think about these things because all of these things have another metric that we have to measure them by. Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. If these things have been brought under surrendered to God, if this is all part of our calling, then there's something else we have to look at, how we go about it. Verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness and with long suffering and forbearing one another in love. So we have these things, and this one is the vocation. Or the calling. And under that comes something that we call identity. And it's made up of a lot of different things that over here, outside of Christ, take on their own, take on their own life. Outside of Christ these things that identify me. Possessions. You suddenly, outside of Christ, you're just, you're just the guy with the new car. Outside of, outside of Christ, your, your occupation just becomes a landscaper. Outside of, outside of talent, outside of Christ, you just become the person that can play the piano with excellency. As we bring them under here and surrender them to Jesus Christ, I now am a disciple of Christ. Paul said, I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher. I'm an apostle. By the way, I'm also a tent maker. You have all these gifts, all these gifts and talents. They're underneath my identity in Christ. My main focus comes off of these things, even occupations. All these things we can use to either lift ourselves up or we can bring them over here and surrender them to Jesus Christ. 
What does he want to do with them? He wants us to expand his kingdom. You're always expanding a kingdom. It's either your kingdom or Christ's kingdom. Someone's kingdom is getting expanded. When we surrender these things to Jesus Christ with the calling of holiness, he can now use them as he wants. We've, we lose ownership of these things that, that he has blessed us with, and now he can use them over here in a whole multitude of ways throughout the world. We do that, first of all, by looking at our heart, doing, making decisions, making purchases, making, taking action with humility, with lowliness of, of heart and mind, with meekness. And we do things that are going to be unifying to the body of Christ. That's part of this walk. Walking worthy of his calling has to do with all the decisions that we, you and I have to make. Are we going to surrender these things and bring it under the lordship of Jesus Christ? What did it cost? What did it cost God to gift us his son, his son Jesus, to make this calling or this vocation possible for us? How did this happen? God made a sacrifice. What did Jesus sacrifice? He's come here, he left the throne of heaven. He came here and sacrificed his life for you and I. We're to walk worthy of that gift. We're to walk worthy of that calling. There's a meeting. You don't have to answer about any of this to me. You don't have to answer to me about any of that. But there's a meeting already scheduled where we do have to. The nobleman is going to return from his journey. And he's going to ask to talk to us in his office. And I'm not making light of the judgment. But we are going to sit down. And we're, he's going to ask us, this whole thing about farming, this whole thing about lawn care, this whole thing about welding and mechanics, how did that benefit me? How, 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 did, that, how did that work out to expand my kingdom? What have you done? What can you tell me you've done with all of that? Did you use it to expand my kingdom? Did you use it to expand yours? Vocation. It's our calling by God to live a faithful life, to live a holy life, and our occupation falls under that. Our resources that come from our occupation fall underneath that calling as well. Walk worthy of the calling. Let's kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, I just thank you for your goodness to us. I thank you that we can meet again this way one more time. And that we can be here to hear a message from you. And I just thank you for this entirety of the service, the way we've been blessed. Father, I thank you for each one that's here, each one that may be listening in. Father, I just pray that they could be inspired and blessed to continue to serve you with their entire life whatever way that you call us each to. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for allowing us, for calling us to walk. And Father, I just pray that each of us would be found walking worthy. So go with us today. Bless us. Bless those that are struggling with health needs. Bless those that are struggling in other ways, temptations. Father, I just pray that you would strengthen them. Pray that you bring healing where it's needed. Father, may we each continue to bless and build another, each other up. May we be found as lights that are set on a hill, shining bright to those that we meet. Go with us, bless us in the week ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
let's sing number 807, uh, 897. Eight hundred ninety seven. Do me so. 